Yeah, our presentation today is on our implementation that we did at INW Manufacturing with Mindstream earlier this year. Um, Mindstream came to me and asked me to <laughs> present at Splash with them, with David Rayson, and um, we were kind of talking about how the implementation and what we were going to present on, and we were uh, in the middle of February, and we realized, you know, we really have gotten our application up and live in less than 60 days because the build started in mid-December. And so I kind of brainstormed this idea of um, a race. Uh, David and myself are both off-roading enthusiasts. And, um, and so I said, what if we compared our implementation to a race? And it kind of spun off from there. And I've been a system administrator in various Hyperion products for the last 10 years. Um, I came to OneStream in January with INW Manufacturing to work on their implementation. I've done five different Hyperion implementations over the years, mostly with um, Hyperion planning and, and S-based. That's my background. Uh, I'm a recent Texas um, returnee, uh, I have been in Colorado for the previous 10 years and just came back to Texas where I've lived before. Um, and then I'm going to turn over to David Rayson, who is the consultant on our project here at INW. Thanks, Amy. Uh, my name is David Rayson. I uh, work with Mindstream Analytics. Uh, I've actually been working with, I've actually worked with my, uh, OneStream as, as both a user uh, and then also uh, as a consultant, uh, about a year ago, I jumped ship from the, the private sector and went into the, the consulting world and uh, began implementing for, uh, for Mindstream Analytics. So as we jump into the, the presentation, as Amy mentioned, we decided to, to do our presentation kind of running a, a racing theme through there. So we've got four main sections we're going to talk about, uh, one of which is going to be preparing for the race. So so that's one kind of where we, we pick the solution or pick your car as we're looking at it. Uh, we look at the, the scope, kind of what is that race going to look like, uh, who's part of the, the pit crew or the race crew, uh, uh, risk assessment, you know, the kind of things that you would do before starting a, a project or a race. Uh, and then we looked at the, the plans during the race. So what do we do to, to keep on track? Uh, you know, who are our sponsors? Who's the crowd? Uh, talk about line and, and how that was and what did that final lap look like uh, and then also looking for the next obviously as, as you have any race and you're successful with it uh, you get hungry and, and you start looking for, for what, okay what do we do next so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, INW manufacturing um, it stands for uh, innovations in nutrition and wellness it all started in 2006 with United One uh, Laboratories. Uh, we're a contract manufacturer who makes um, personal care products, over-the-counter drugs, dietary supplements, protein powders, cosmetics, um, and and we started it, like I said, in 2006 with United One uh, International Laboratories in a 30,000 square foot manufacturing plant. Um, from there, in 2014, United One was acquired by Rosewood, which is our private equity firm, and they're um, very keen on acquiring companies. So in 2017, uh, in the spring, we acquired... ...in Texas called ProTech. So going into 2018, we had two manufacturers. A vertical acquisition with one of our distribution chains um, called I and was renamed INW Brands in March. And then in um, we also acquired one of our other um, packaging companies, FastPack, 
in fall of 2018, and we acquired a facility, a manufacturing facility in California called Proform. Um, and then we also broke out our corporate um, expenses into INW manufacturing. So at the end of 2018, we were looking at five different source systems um, with eight different um, reporting entities. And we were in the process of acquiring um, another manufacturing facility in Phoenix. So when we started in December um, building the application, you know, we were already at a point where there was a lot of manual uh, mapping of accounts into um, the United One ERP system we were in DCOM. And so what we were doing was mapping the GL accounts and posting a, a journal entry at the end of each month in order to do consolidated reporting, manually creating intercompany eliminations. So there's a lot of manual reporting, a lot of reports that were pulled from outside the system. At Go Live, um, like I said, we acquired Phoenix Formulations uh, February 7th of 2019, which was right as we were going live. So we were desperately in need of a system to be able to consolidate. For reporting purposes. So um, why did we pick one stream? So at the time, as we were looking at all these acquisitions, our CFO, Melissa Carter, um, through our audit firm, MCG, started investigating OneStream. Um, and OneStream really seemed like the perfect solution to handle all the challenges of the multiple acquisitions um, because we had multiple source systems. And it's just really for a manufacturing company not feasible to come in day one and, and change out the ERP system. What we needed is to be able to pull their trial balance and load their data and be able to report um, the first day of the acquisition. So, um, like I said earlier, I've had 10 years of Hyperion experience. So coming into this project, I came in um, the 1st of January. And, you know, we picked our car. We had picked one stream and, and, and we were already on the race to um, start implementing OneStream. And it really took me um, a couple of weeks to understand, you know, how OneStream was different from products that I've worked on previously. What can OneStream do that others can't? I really liked the, um, the academy. That was really helpful for me to be able to understand how the system worked and the things that we were needing to do. Um, to make our implementation run smoothly. I'm going to turn it over to David so he can tell you some of the things that we did to make sure we were ready to go. So once we'd identified kind of the, the landscape of, you know, what, what was going on with the company, how it had evolved, and you know, obviously they had chosen uh, one stream, uh, we had to kind of go through and look at the, identify the sources of data and get sample files. With the different acquisitions that INW had done, uh, we had multiple source, source systems to, to pull data from, and it, it was a little challenging getting all that together. But we identified the data, uh, and we also identified uh, at what level we needed to tie out that historical data. And at that point, it was a, a GL and cost center, that kind of level. We had to identify what we were going to use for, for metadata, so the dimensions we needed, uh, you know, certainly you've got the chart of accounts, uh, but then also we were looking at uh, departments and cost centers, or products, uh, whether we were going to use an existing list uh, from, from one of the companies or whether we we're going to have a, a consolidated kind of global list. Uh, we had to, to then create the, the mappings uh, between those source systems and uh, what we we're going to use is the one stream metadata. So we went through that process and, you know, basically uh, had to to look at that current reporting to understand how all of that metadata was going to tie together to give them a, a consolidated view that that made sense for them uh, again with with all of those entities coming in and recognizing that uh, that there were going to be more entities coming uh, the the INW manufacturing chart of accounts was established for us 
so we only had to do some some minor adjustments to the numbering uh, to to get everything aligned from from for them where it was that global perspective. We also had to to look at the process flow uh, from from load to lock. So as we get those files in from the source systems, uh, get them loaded into one stream, uh, do whatever we need to do from an adjustment standpoint to make sure the data is valid uh, and accurate. Uh, and then finally, ultimately, lock the system down to where we've got the reporting done for, for the period. We had to, to look, too, uh, on a process of who was going to be maintaining the system from a, a metadata standpoint, transformation rule updates. You know, as, as the system is getting loaded, uh, certainly you're going to run into to intersection errors or errors where maybe a new account was created in the source system. You know, we had to identify... have access at what from uh, from the sites who's going to be able to, to do uh, updates of transformation rules, create metadata, create queue views. Uh, it really with, with the, the number of people that were playing and coming into uh, into the, the system from the different entities, uh, we really had to, to look at each user's ability and what, what access we wanted to, to provide for them. Um, and then who has the final say? So as we're going to be going through this process, we know we're going to run into validation issues. Um, we need to, to make sure that as we looked at the organization, how are we going to approach, how are we going to adjust the financials to make sure that what we had in one stream was, was matching uh, what their reported results were, how we're going to approach that. As we look at that, we had uh, uh, one person, Melissa Carter, who's a CFO, and she was the one that was really one, making the final call. And, and she made the decision on the front end to, to adjust source systems so that it matched one stream, a.k.a. that it that we had. Uh, and then finally, uh, approving and blocking any scope changes. You know, who was going to be responsible for, for looking at scope changes uh, as they came up uh, and whether they were going to get approved or, or ultimately were going to get blocked. And by defining all of this on the front end uh, and, and being able to hold to that, that really made sure that we were, were ready to go and, and ready to move fast. One of the things that we really um, focused on a lot was and making sure that our car, our one stream, was ready to go, was establishing a, a mapping source data file. So until we got all of the mappings into one stream and we could utilize um, the pre-built reports for um, looking at those mappings, we needed to have a way to be able to VLOOK up off of um, one file that we could um, be able to validate data. And so what we created was a system that allowed us to input the source system, the account and the description, and then where that was mapped to our reporting system. So like I said, we were reporting out of um, our DCOM ERP system, loading trial balances. So we were already mapping some of our source systems into the DCOM chart of accounts, which was very, very similar to the chart of accounts, the global chart of accounts that we were using in one stream. So we created that mapping and then how that mapped from the reporting system into one stream. So we could filter off of this report and be able to look at um, if those accounts were mapping into the reporting system where they should be mapping into one stream. I took it and put the one stream account and then some of the roll up so I could look at whether it was, you know, net sales or SGNA um, or COGS. And so I could look at those roll ups to see what accounts were rolling into that grouping. And it was really helpful as we um, acquired our company Phoenix formulations in February, we used that similar system to help map their chart of accounts into one stream. Um, and it would made it so much easier for the controller there who was already inundated with acquisition items to be completed to get her help in um, David. <laughs> yeah, did you have more? Do you, do you want to go no, more? No, no, you're in? good. It's okay. Okay. 
Okay, so as, as Amy mentioned, you know, we we basically had to set up an easy way to validate. So so we created a income statement that mirrored what they were looking at uh, currently with their source systems. And if if you look at the the slide here, this is actually a, a report where we had a combination of GL accounts uh, and then our I think it was our UD two field the the product. So the sales they actually showed uh, by UD two by product, uh, and then as you got down into the cost, that all went to to a GL account uh, uh, dimension. So we created this view to to be able to you know quickly uh, uh, look at the results. Uh, and we were able to take this and compare it against the the existing report. And actually, what Amy ended up doing was was putting this in with an XF get cell that you know when the controllers went in and actually were were able to go in and make their updates, uh, she could go in, uh, obviously create a new version so we had the historical view on it. She could refresh and immediately see. Uh, if any adjustment was done, if the adjustment was done completely and correctly, and, and then also if, if anything else uh, uh, actually popped up new, uh, which we actually did have. So, right. you know, with the, the similar view of the report and layout, it made the, the reconciliation easier. Uh, it, obvi- it also helped with the, the change management and that uh, users were accustomed to seeing that type of layout. So, so for them, it was just kind of a, a, just a, a different look, but the layout and form was all the same. So the scope of the race uh, that we set for INW manufacturing a timeline uh, that scope gets managed. And with the, the scope of the consolidating reporting, um, we made sure that we had the, the amount of time that we needed to, to do that. Uh, and we actually got pushed a little bit from the, the board of directors as well to, to try to cut down on it. So, so there really wasn't any uh, fluff time that we had in, in our timeline. Uh, but with that scope, we stayed focused on that. Uh, we identified what was, was critical for creating a, a foundation of a system on which INW could build what else they wanted to do next, whatever that was. Uh, but that, that foundation, the financial foundation, and making sure that tied into the general ledgers uh, and that the, the numbers were correct, and that that foundation was solid. That was a, the critical piece that we identified here. Um, we also identified that we wanted to have some history, uh, and it's really on the history side. It's it's important to focus on on what you need, not necessarily what you want, because because certainly everybody's like a oh, load load years of history, uh, but but that can add complicating factors as you know, specifically with I and W, uh, how the business evolves as they were doing multiple acquisitions and and trying to to align all of that historical data. In the, in the case of INW, we just did one year of historical, uh, which even that, because I think we had, what, Amy, like three acquisitions or something during 2018. Uh, right. Yeah, so so even, even at that, it made it uh, challenging to get that historical data into the system, but, but we were able to do that uh, and get it tied out. INW really focused on, on what the need was and left the wants uh, for later fa- later phases, and it enabled them to to better understand their organization and their data. You know, as we look at the intercompany activity that was was obviously growing as it did more acquisitions, uh, as they understood better the different source systems. You know, you've got as, as they're doing the acquisitions, you've got source systems that these companies are operating on. They have all their manufacturing in these source systems, uh, so it really gave gave a chance to understand what we had from a source system perspective. Uh, and what other data could be out there available to to look at that, what that next phase was. Um, and also gave the level of effort that it would take to do that. Yeah, one of the one of the the key things with that, um, and really staying within the the scope of the race, we had a lot of well. We we want to start going this direction, or we're going to be doing this, and we really had to rein everyone in and said, okay, well, where are we reporting today? Not where we're going to be reporting three months from now. Where are we reporting today? And that's where we're going to build today, and then we'll cross the bridge of three months from now when we when we get to three months from now. So that yeah, was, was really. Like- 
Yeah, one of the that things was, that we was one of the big things. <laughs> we had to rein in a little bit because we've changed our entity structure um, three times since the go live just because we've changed. We've taken on our holdings company trial balance. We're managing that. Some of our vertical acquisitions where they were their own separate entity are now being um, merged in with another entity. So they're not going to exist as a separate entity anymore. So these are all things that OneStream really, um, at the time of the implementation, we said, okay, how are we reporting today? But OneStream makes it really easy to be able to go in and make those changes um, and change to the way we need to report our, um, our consolidated structure. It's fantastic. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things too is that that as we were going through and we were having a design meeting and and identifying what was going to be in scope, uh, we also took uh, and put in that document what was going to be out of scope. You know, obviously, as you you've got a project of this size, there's a lot of different players and and all of the players kind of have their different priority lists depending on whatever their focus is of, of what they'd like to see in the system. So by identifying what was in scope and then importantly what was not in scope. Uh, we were able to point back to that document and say, hey, okay, I, I hear you. This is important. And we've identified that to a later phase. And that's one thing that Melissa really helped us with, the CFO, that she was was held firm to that and backed us up and supported us with the, I'm sorry, that's not in the scope and we're not going to not gonna have any discussions on that. And, and obviously, you need to, to take into account what it is you want to do in the future so that you don't you know, build a solution that, that blocks you. You want to build a solution that, that enables you in the future. Um, but to, to get into to heavy design discussions and actually trying to implement pieces of that while you're trying to focus on building that base foundation of, of financials, uh, it's going to extend out your timeline and it's going to it's going to increase costs and, and cause you issues. So, so it's a, a big big kudos for Melissa for uh, supporting us with the, the scope control. Oh yeah, it is very helpful to have. Um people at the top level supporting the project and, and making the decisions quickly, turning things around. Uh, and that kind of talks about under our next slide that talks about who is the part of our, who is in our pit crew. Um, so we were kind of laughing when we came across this, Dave and I were talking, you know, if we're having a car and we're running a race, then we have this crew that's working on the race with us. So we talk about the driver. Um, in the beginning, the driver really was our CFO as she made the decision to go with OneStream. And then um, she hired myself, who was going to be the, the admin. And then the race now becomes mine. So now I get to to drive the car, which is the funnest part of the race, I think. But um, but who's supporting me as I'm driving the car? Somebody has to be there to change the tires and you know do all that work. So then we have our pit crew, so our support team. Um, first off, we had our consultants. We had Mindstream. David Rayson was was on site uh, for several weeks, and then we actually had another. Our auditing firm had a consulting side, um, and they had a person who was on our our project for a couple of weeks, helping with validating data and um, making sure, from an audit perspective, that we were going to be able to be in compliance. And then we had our, our IT department that was helping with setting up our VPN connections, making sure that all of our different facilities who are all on different networks were, you know, had they all had to do some upgrades with their VPN in order to connect. We're um, on a cloud environment and to make sure that we could connect. And then our accounting teams, huge kudos to all of these folks at the different facilities who were turning around uh, as we ran into data validation issues and we were getting things corrected. They were really turning things around quickly and that helped with getting our implementation up and live and tied out and the data validated. Let me talk about who's sponsoring the race. So really our sponsors are our CFO, our CEO, our board of directors, our private equity firm. You know, these are all the people that are saying, hey, we need something in order to report better, this is what we're gonna do. And they wanna see a return on the investment. They wanna see us win the race and they wanna, um, you know, they have a level of expectation of what they wanna see. And then we have the crowd, which is the end users of data. Um, we have one analyst on our team and, and the different controllers and accounting teams that are utilizing the data. And as they get more familiar with it, they're really getting excited about what the system can provide. 
but with any uh, project, there comes risk. So David's going to talk about. Yeah, so so definitely you want to identify uh, what risks you have in your project. Uh, there's certainly uh, risk that's going to be common across any environment. You talk about the data validations and that, and the, uh, you know, if you're doing it over year end, the year end audit. Um, in the case of INW, we had the the different risk of of acquisition. So, you know, we we kind of had to look at everything and evaluate what the the impact would potentially be, and and obviously uh, a level of probability of the and uh, uh, contingency plans. As we looked at the the data validation, uh, we established a process of what needed to be validated and what that level of materiality was, uh, and then how are we going to handle any validation issues that came up. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Melissa was very good in, in defining what that process would look like and, and how it should be done, and, and she main, maintained that. And anytime we had any issues, uh, you know, if somebody, uh, one of the controllers was having a, a challenge with prioritization, uh, Melissa was able to step in and, and help define what the right priority was and ensured that, that you know, we didn't have any uh, major issues that were, were blocks for us. Um, case of INW, we, we knew on the front end that there was a very high probability that there was going to be an acquisition. Uh, we kind of had a rough estimate of, of the, the, the timing that it would occur. Uh, and we decided at that point that, that it would be in scope or it would be out of scope. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't really decide, in other words. Uh, we decided in the beginning that as we were going into the project, we would look and find out where we were if the acquisition occurred. And at that point, we would make a decision as to whether we would try to roll that acquisition into uh, into the go live and into the, the initial build, or whether we would hold it back. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, there was time and capacity to to be able to roll that in, uh, and we were able to include that. Uh, another issue that we came as we were going, uh, we were doing the build at the same time that we had the year end audit. So as we look at the, the controllers, uh, who are some of our critical resources, uh, they were definitely stretched between uh, trying to, to help us with validation issues and getting through the requirements for uh, closing out the year-end and the year-end audit. And that's, that's one that uh, ultimately we feel that we underestimated what that demand was. Uh, we did run into to definitely time constraints in, in getting that through. Um, the, the audit adjustments and uh, we ran into the audit adjustments were coming into the December financials. And, and by the time we were getting those in, we really were, were at a point that we were running parallel. So we kind of had to, to push, the controllers had to push the audit adjustments through the, the legacy way of doing the consolidation. Uh, and then we also had to, to roll them through, uh, through one string to make sure that we were staying in sync uh, with the legacy systems. And that really just it took a lot more time. There were a lot more audit adjustments uh, than than what we had anticipated. So so that was one that you know if you've got that you're, you see that you're doing it over year end or during a year end timing, uh, definitely want to be aware of of the potential uh, of, of time constraints. Uh, we also had the risk of multiple systems. So so as we looked at each source system, each source system being its own entity before it was brought into to INW. You know, they really had their own account structure, their own way of, of running their consolidations. Uh, so we kind of had to, to look at the way to bring all of that together and understand that as we did, uh, we would probably have mapping challenges and, and things that need to be updated from those source systems. Uh, so that definitely was, was a, a risk that we, we faced and were able to work with. Uh, and then change management was another risk we, we looked at. Um, you know, we had, uh, uh, not only the change management of moving the users to a new consolidation system and a new system for reporting, uh, we had a couple of entities that were actually changing their source systems as well uh, over the year end uh, and changing some of their account mappings that they had. Uh, so between the two years and, and changing source systems, uh, definitely some risk there. Um, and then communication. Uh, communication is always a risk in a project this size when you've got um, uh, workers, the controllers who are all remote. Um, so we've created tracking documents to make sure that, you know, for, for each week we're able to present a clear and recognizable and, and consistent way of, of how our format was or how our, our project was progressing. 
So as we look at the plans during the race, uh, you know, we looked at, at trying to, what we're going to do to, to keep the, the car on the track or keep the, the project on track, uh, look at our, our sponsors and, you know, these are the people, the crowd and the sponsors are the ones that are watching closely. Uh, we need to look at how we were, were keeping them informed. Um, the, the pit stops, so what pit stops uh, do you know that are going to you have coming up? Uh, and then also, what are we going to do when, when the car goes off the track or you have these unplanned pit stops? So as we, we kind of were getting ready for that race, we were looking at what are we going to do during and how are we going to handle those situations? So one of the first things in, you know, being in the race, right, and the implementation race, is making sure we keep on track. They time every race. They time how fast you complete the first lap. Um, and so that was the same thing we needed to do with our project. So we had weekly meetings that were, and we had weekly task lists assigned to help us stay on track. Um, and then I also created a tracking document. And I'm gonna show you this here in just a second. Um, so that we can, as we're, we had acquisitions that happened during various parts of the year and as we're loading data I wanted to make sure that we were you know keeping track of which entity we loaded data for and which entity we validated the data for and at different levels so we validated that the trial balance ties out we validated the income statement and the balance sheet and the cash flow that everything's done and good to go um, and then the, how do I report this to my CFO every week to tell her we're this percentage I mean we're we're accounting people, so we like numbers. So this was um, one of the things that we did was creating a tracking document. We also created a, a repeatable validation process where um, I assigned, we called it um, VI and then numbered them. So there were validation issues. Um, so that everything associated with that validation issue was tagged with that number. As we were sending emails back and forth, um, we could track it and understand, you know, as we resolve these issues and what, you know, what outstanding validation issues were we waiting to resolve to move on in the project. Um, and this really helps us watch the scope and the timing intervals. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, David. So this is our validation document. And on here you can see that we had our trial balances loaded and what percentage, these were the um, months that we were loading for historical purposes, and what percentage we were at with being loaded, what percentage we were at with being reviewed, um, and what is our total percentage completed. So once it was done, um, then it would be picked up as completed. And so I could go each week and, and tell the CFO, say, okay, well, we're, we've, we've reviewed 88% of the data, we're 21% completed, um, here's the validation issue. So you can see in various months I have a VIO4. So that validation issue affected five months. Um, and then the different, you know, and then in our company we had some challenges with um, some of our systems had to create in our company. So this was one of the documents that we created to help keep us on track and, and kind of give a solid understanding of where we were at with tying out the data. The next document, um, on the next slide kind of shows our validation issues. So you can see each one, um, what the, a kind of short description of what the issue was and when it was completed. So as we went into these weekly meetings, I could go to the CFO and say, hey, you know, we still have outstanding VI-12, which is a pro form mapping issue, you know, and we knew who was, who that had been sent to to resolve that issue. So this helped us really turn around the validation issues um, and tie out the data, which is usually one of the biggest parts of any any implementation is just tying out data. Let me went on. There were some some crowd pleasers that we um, we used. I'm gonna let David tell you about our end user training yeah. from Access Marketplace. Yeah. So, so obviously, as uh, you're going through the project, uh, you're you're personally involved in it, and you want to make sure that it does well. But, but you've also got a lot of eyes on you. You've got the the sponsors, as Amy mentioned, that you know the CFO, CEO, the board. Uh, we've got the crowd, the end users. You know, everybody's kind of looking and and has what I'll say their own level of expectations as to what they're going to see when this gets done. 
Um, so, you know, as, as, you know, you've got sponsors with the eyes on it and they start bringing up items that, that are out of scope or the kind of where, where their focus is, uh, we were able to use that design document that said, hey, this is and this is not in scope and, and this is on the fence depending on time. Uh, so we were able to, to manage them with that. Uh, as far as the end users are concerned, kind of what we what we called our crowd, uh, we had uh, UA test, UAT uh, the testing session, and what we did was we uh, Amy actually asked uh, David Respaldiza, our one stream sales rep, to come in and, and do kind of a, a quick demo. So that's the way that, that Amy started off the UAT, kind of showing the users one stream and, and what was possible inside of one stream. You know, kind of what does that that future look and uh, kind of open up uh, the dream space to to see what could be there. And after the the, the demo, we went into uh, uh, looking at where are we right now. So so getting the users into the system and and getting them using it, getting them seeing their data, getting them loading their data. Uh, and that's that's where Amy actually what we got on the, the screen here is a, a shot from the FX marketplace. Uh, Amy went and downloaded the the Excel training documentation that's there and, and in just a very short time she was able to to modify that training to make it uh, INW specific and INW branded as a you know she'd come in and do a few screenshots from from their system so that that's what the users were actually seeing uh, it made it easy to, to get that training into the system or into the into the training the documentation and after we got through the the UAT uh, Amy did a, a brainstorming session with the users uh, kind of getting their view of what they see as possible or what, what it is that they would like to see in the system and, and a perspective from them on, you know, uh, how much time do they have or how much effort do they think it would be involved and, and being able to, to work with them to help to kind of not only define but to help provide a vision of what that, that uh, future view could look like as, uh, as we went through and, and updated one stream. So the, the pit stops uh, was a biggie. Uh, you know, it's obviously you've got some pit stops that you know are going to, to be occurring uh, during your, your project. Uh, Amy had admin training, so we knew what in advance what week that would be, and we made plans around that to, to make sure that she was, was up to date. And, uh, you know, she's certainly she had time uh, in the evening to help, but, but uh, you know, anybody that's, that's new to the admin training will tell you that, you know, you go and and your mind starts running in different directions and, and you want to go in and try different things, you're not necessarily focused on the project. So so recognizing that, we knew what the week of admin training was going to look like. We had plans of, of what I was going to be working on during that time and really, to the most part, tried to minimize Amy's time to need to be on the project so she could really focus and uh, use that admin training to the, to the best and to be able to, to advance her skills as much as possible during that week. Uh, there's going to be holidays. There's going to be uh, vacations that are, are coming. Um, uh, you know, we got to the uh, unplanned events or illnesses. We actually had one controller that uh, got a, a mild form of, of pneumonia, and she was out for I think what maybe ten days or something like that. Yeah, um, she was out for a little while. Yeah, we so that that definitely was booked. unplanned. Yeah, that was yeah. a challenge. Yeah, yeah, because there there were were things that that she needed to do that that controller needed to do. Uh, and she was actually the only one that was able to do that. So, so that did provide us uh, some some unplanned pit stops. Uh, but again, by by having everything else laid out, we were able to to adapt and to continue on while holding back on the components that she needed to to take care of. So that that when she did get better and was able to come back and get that work done, uh, we were able to to rapidly put the the project back on track. Um, Data, data validation issues are going to come up. You're, you're going to have challenges. Uh, it all, all depends on where you're coming from. But, you know, the, the big thing with the, the pit stops uh, for both the unplanned uh, and planned are to, to set expectations and manage them so that as you're going through, you know, everybody knows that, hey, there's admin training and we know there's holidays and we know these things are coming up uh, and set the expectations so that, okay, Amy's got training in two weeks. Amy's got training in one week. Amy's out for training. Uh, Amy's back from training. Um, and then if you've got, you know, unplanned ones, you know, particularly with the controller going, going out sick for, for that time, 
you know, it's important to, to manage and make sure that your, your crowd and your, your sponsors and the people with the eyes on the project, that they're, they're up to date and they know what's happening and they're comfortable that you've got a good grip on the project. And of course, with any implementation, there's always unexpected issues when they can totally throw your implementation off track. And we ran into a few, um, one of which was data validation issues. And so as we were loading year-to-date data, um, and comparing it to our reporting system, we were loading data from our source system and then comparing the data to the consolidated um, data out of our reporting system, we found um, several times where our facilities had posted late entries after the data had already been loaded into the reporting system, so then we would have a variance in the data. So it was decided really early on when we started running into these issues that the source system would be fixed. So if they posted a late entry that was not in the reporting system, then the source system was going to go correct it. And that was the plan and that helped us really turn around um, getting those issues corrected in the source system. And that was the other thing is that we were, we were going to correct any data validation issues in the source system. Um, we did have some mapping changes. So um, because we were coming in in 2019, we actually ended up with a couple of our facilities having two sets of transformation rules because we had mapping for 2018 as it was reported, and then we had mapping for 2019, which was more in line with our global reporting um, structure. Um, and then we had some issues with our VPNs that didn't get set up that became very clear in our UAT. We're going to talk about that. Um, one of our biggest unplanned pit stops in the next slide really was um, in our company. So as we saw in the very beginning, we didn't have a lot of, I mean, we were acquiring companies starting in 2017. So really 2018, I want to say like fall-ish is when we started to really pick up with some of our intercompany transactions and we were top siding the eliminations in our reporting system. So none of the source systems had those intercompany accounts broken out. And so that was one of the challenges was getting our um, our source systems to break out intercompany AR, AP, sales, COGS. Um, and this has been a challenge this year we've, we've been working on. Um, I created an intercompany document that documented all of the different types of intercompany transactions that we've experienced to date and how those are processed through the system so that they'll eliminate in one stream. Um, with our historical data, what we decided to do was to create um, journal entries in order to mimic the reporting system's elimination rather than trying to go back and and journal entry into all the correct accounts so it eliminated properly in the system. Um, that, that just wasn't a very efficient use of time uh, for our implementation. One of the next pit stops on the next slide um, that we ran into was our VPNs. So during, um, in the very beginning, it had been identified that um, several of our facilities had outdated VPN systems that were not supported by Azure Cloud. So they were supposed to upgrade those and we did not realize until we were during UAT, um, all of our controllers came into our, our corporate uh, facility and everything worked fine here. And as they went back to their different um, facilities and connected through their VPNs, they could not access OneStream. And this is when we realized that um, we had to upgrade those VPNs and we had to work with OneStream and I'm OneStream support. And honestly, this is the best support that I've ever received. We had um, with one of our facilities, OneStream actually um, set up a meeting with Microsoft to help with the settings on our VPN system, um, which is unheard of in and support and we just got outstanding support and helping to make sure that all of the issues were resolved um we've we've still in fact yesterday one stream support was helping our phoenix facility as they reconfigured their vpn to move off of um their previous sister company's network 
um, once again, they were right there helping our IT manager step by step, getting it set up um, and making sure that we were all good to go. Really helped us to get to the finish line. Yes, yeah, so as we uh, started to realize we were approaching the, the finish line, uh, we created a, a punch list of priorities that needed to be done prior to, to actually going live with it. And we split the list up between uh, items that really needed to be completed prior to uh, migrating to production, um, things that we actually wanted to do as a part of the migration, uh, and then finally, what items did we uh, did we think that we could put off until after we had done after we completed the the migration? Uh, as we were were coming in, we realized too that uh, we did have some some extra capacity and there was some extra time. Uh, Amy, Amy was very busy uh, out with the XF marketplace and the the training videos that are out there. Uh, it seemed like every time I would, I would go into her office, she had her headphones on and she was she was buried in looking at those. Uh, but she actually, uh, before we went uh, live with the system, was adding KPIs uh, into the system uh, and and actually starting to to scope uh, adding pro forma data into the system from from the recent applications. Uh, so you know even even as we were approaching the, the finish line, yeah, okay, we were looking and focusing on you know what do we need to get done and making sure that that we were keeping up the pace and all of that. Uh, but it wasn't because of the way we had had run the race. Uh, it wasn't one where it was that we were working, you know, 16 or 18 hour days. Uh, there, there, it was one where we, you know, we could put in our, our normal eight or 10 hours a day, uh, and still within that have some capacity for, for looking at other things and, and doing a little bit extra. Uh, and that was a really nice way to, to be able to, to head into the finish line. You know, what we would say is with a, a good lap lead, uh, we were, we were heading into, heading into the finish line. And then we hit the the winner circle. So for for me and my perspective uh, as uh, working for Mindstream and the, the consultant on the project, uh, I had a a client that's uh, referenceable and happy, and we completed the the project uh, earlier in scope, and and you know had a successful transfer. You know, Amy was really great in in coming in, and and you know one of the things that I had mentioned that that for me Amy did really well. Is she came in with all of that Hyperion experience, uh, and in making the transition to to one stream, uh, she she did something for me that was critical, which was she came in and said, "Okay, I could do this in Hyperion. Now, how do I do that in one stream?" Uh, as opposed to saying, "Hey, I did this in Hyperion this way, so I'm going to do it this way, that same way uh, in one stream." You know, there's there's a lot of capability in that system, and and Amy was able to transition and, and look at it through, I'll say, a different lens. Uh, and take what she'd learned on the XF marketplace and take all of the, the knowledge she's had in the, in the, the back of her, her history uh, and be able to combine those two things and, and really take and run with, with one stream, enabling that successful admin transfer. Yeah, and for the company, for INW, um, we have visibility into our entity data. My CFO is not spending weekends consolidating data she's actually looking at the data and um as of our may close we closed for four and a half days we were done and had consolidated reporting ready to go so for the weekend my boss was able to her cfo um could actually analyze the data and and look at some additional entries that needed to go in and understanding rather than spending it's like, okay, well, now we're closed. Now I have to spend the next two, three days consolidating all the data. Um, and that really is a huge win in the amount of time that our accounting team was spending um, doing all that stuff. Um, we now have consistent KPIs across the board, which is, and we can look at it um, at a consolidated level, at an entity level. Um, and our huge win is that we, met our deadline and actually exceeded it by a month. We went live with our February close, which was amazing. And we had a great, you know, thanks to the support of Mindstream, we had a great base of our application to move on to the next phases. And that's um, the things that we're looking at for, our, for our, our next races. We've actually done a couple. We've implemented our uh, customer data, our revenue by customer. 
um, which went live with our, our previous close, with April close. Um, we just upgraded to 5.1 um, Monday this week, <laughs> and that was the easiest upgrade I've ever done. It's amazing. Um, you know, we kind of look at, um, we're working on our budget application and um, looking at some of the XF Marketplace um, different uh, items that we can add in and utilize to really make our budget not um, an input, but more of an analyst tool. Um, and so we're really excited to move on to the next race and we're really grateful for you know, what Mindstream brought to our implementation and being able to be up and live in 60 days. Yeah. So how, how long did that upgrade take, Amy? Was it, was it two hours? Yeah, it was two hours. Yeah. So, so major release from, upgrade in two hours. Yeah. From 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. I sent notice to my users. I'm pretty sure none of them were even awake yet. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody yeah, noticed I, I, except I, me. <laughs> no, I know. And it's, I've, I've been on one stream like for five years. So I don't know. It was version I don't know, two or something like that. I think is what I originally started with or three. And, you know, going through all of those upgrades, it's just, it's always been that easy. It's, it's just a non-issue. It's amazing how, how easy it is to, to do the upgrades, even when there's schema changes in the database, you know, basically it's just, it's a non-issue. It's a non-concern. You still have to do your validations and all, but it just really is a, it's simple to get that done. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, uh, Michelle, we'll turn it back over to you and uh, see uh, see what questions we have. Uh, great, thank you, uh, Amy and David, for that great review of uh, such a successful one stream project. Um, a couple of questions did come in. Um, we have just enough time, um, and folks, if you um, too shy to ask questions and you think of something afterwards, just let us know. So the first question is, uh, why did you decide not to do Direct Connect on your initial implementation? So I can answer that. Um, since we have five different source systems, and um, if you didn't catch that, we had two of our companies change source systems in the middle of implementation, um, and we're really aggressively um, looking at acquisitions. We have three that are currently on the horizon. Um, potential with it by the end of the year. We really needed um, a consistent way to get acquisitions in the system up and live. And as you all know, that setting up Direct Connect can, can take time. And um, we were having issues with VPN and our networks, and we're actually looking at changing our network structure completely. So it made more sense um, from our perspective to just load flat files and, and have a consistent process that could be done you know, as our, our equipment facility, we have a facility out in Quitman, Texas, and they do have some um, connection issues because they are out in the middle of, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, if they have issues, they can actually email me their files and I can upload them for them. So we're not holding up our clothes because of network issues. So as we're looking at um, going into next year and setting up that direct connect, and we can do that, um, at a, at a point where we have the ability to test it, but we have a fail safe backup process so that we are reporting um, and meeting our deadlines. Great, um, thank you for that. Um, and the, the question is uh, for phase two and beyond, are you continuing with this rapid implementation approach? Yes, I am. Um, we, we don't have consultants working with us currently, um, but a lot of it is really looking at the project and focusing on, um, for example, our, our customer database. I, I created a cube so that we could report our customer data and what our CFO wanted was um, COGS and overhead rates and SKU level data. And a lot of our plants, the source system data was gonna Take, we were going to have to create new reports, and so I said, okay, what can we get done um, and up live before the next close? So I picked up just the revenue portion of the customer data. I could create reports that were already there out of the system without having to change anything. So I said, okay, for the scope of this report, we're going to go and we're going to get this data. So now my monthly reporting package all comes out of one stream um, and is refreshable. We use, I actually took the 
XF Get Cell and the original reporting package um, and just transformed it to pull the data out of one stream. So it looks exactly like it did prior to one stream, other than they're not having to consolidate it all. And so then, then we just pick small pieces of the project and we, as we look at the next phase and we can work more on fixing the data in the source system so that it's consistent across all of our facilities. Okay. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, please, if you have um, uh, questions, uh, need some additional information, there's our contact information, uh, info at mindstreamanalytics.com. Um, we look forward to hosting you on future webinars. Um, so everybody, please have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks.